Hello, welcome uh, to my talk on React. I'm a uh, software engineer in the St. Louis area, that's uh, in Missouri, right in the middle of the US. And uh, I want to start by saying that uh, I've been working with Angular for almost three years now. And it's a nice framework, I like it just fine. In fact, I put a lot of effort into creating a course on Angular. Imagine my dismay when I heard all the news about Angular 2 and how everything about it would be different. And so because of that, I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to evaluate whether I want to look at another framework instead of sticking with Angular. And so I spent some time looking into React and decided that I really liked it. And uh, as the title of the talk says, uh, I think that React is a simpler framework than either Angular 1 or Angular 2. Now, I do think that Angular 2 is simpler than Angular 1, so I wouldn't feel bad if you're using either of those. I just feel that React is even simpler, and so I hope to convince you of that in this talk. As I said, I work for a consulting company in the St. Louis area called OCI, and I have some flyers up here that are on the floor there. I'd love for you to take them as you leave if you're interested in any of that. Otherwise, I have to take them home on the plane, and I don't want to do that. And so here's just a quick summary of what OCI does. We are the new home of the Grails framework. Some of you Java developers are probably familiar with that. And there's a Grails sticker in that handout. Maybe you'll want that. Uh, but we help companies move from commercial software to open source software. And we're involved in IoT projects and DevOps. And we do on-site development in our shop. And we go out to clients and do consulting. And we do lots of training. And I'll be teaching a class on React, the uh, first one at the end of March. So that's exciting. Uh, so what is React? So this is a, a web app library from Facebook. And it focuses on the view portion. It's not a full stack like other frameworks like Angular or Ember. And so you go find libraries to do the other parts. Now, that's a thing that gives a lot of people pause because they think it might be hard to find these pieces that I need. And what if everybody's making different choices and now all of our apps are different? Uh, I don't believe that is the case. It seems to me that in all the categories of other tools you might need, there is a clear front runner. And I'm going to list some of those coming up. React gives you a one-way reactive data flow. And so what happens here is that your UI reacts to changes in the state. The state is just data describing what's happening in your app. You don't have two-way data binding as is popular in Angular 1. Angular 2 also kind of moves away from two-way data binding. When you have this two-way data binding as Angular 1 has, you end up asking yourself questions like, oh, what is it that triggered this digest cycle? Or maybe it didn't happen, and should I manually trigger it? And all those kind of thoughts go away when you get rid of two-way data binding. And so it makes it easier for you to follow the flow of the data. What you think about is that I have these components in my app, and an event has occurred. And when that event occurs, uh, that's going to cause my state to change in some way. And because the state has changed, parts of my UI will re-render themselves. And uh, so that really simplifies your thought process. React is used by a lot of companies that you see listed up there. And uh, one kind of interesting point is that Facebook uses React a lot more than Google uses Angular. You can use React in an existing application. You don't have to change it all over to use React. You can just start at the kind of leaf nodes of your UI and gradually change components from whatever style they were in to a React style. In React, you define a bunch of components, and those components are composable. It's very common to have a component that inside it uses many other components. Components get their data primarily or really exclusively from two places. It comes from state or it comes from props. As we're going to see, most of your components will get their data from props. Uh, you can render uh, these components in the browser, but you can also do your rendering from the server. And an interesting thing that people do with that is to speed up startup time of their app. They might render the initial page on the server and then all the rest on the client side. Also, it's possible that the user has disabled JavaScript in the, in the browser. And in that case, that can be detected and then all the pages can be uh, coming from the server side. The most common use of this framework is to render a web app in a normal web browser, but you can render other kinds of things. You can render to an HTML canvas, you can render to SVG, and you can render to Android and iOS devices. 
for that last category, you use this thing called React Native. And the advantage there is that you become comfortable with this framework, and then you can use the same uh, approach for uh, any of those kinds of apps. There's very good browser support, but one thing to note is that support for IE8 is going to be dropped in the next version of React. Probably nobody's too sad about that. The thing that makes React really fast is that it uses a thing called a virtual DOM. So when it renders to the browser the first time, it creates a representation of the DOM, its own representation, and then it pushes that out to the browser. And then the next time it has to render, it creates a new version of this virtual DOM, and then it diffs it against the one that it already had, and it figures out what is the minimal set of changes it could make uh, to update the browser. And that makes it incredibly fast. And so this seems counterintuitive, this idea that you could, on every change or every event that happens, re-render the entire UI. But that's essentially way, the way that your code appears is that you're asking it, just repaint everything. But it uses this virtual DOM approach to determine that there's really not much that has to change and it just changes those small bits. So it gets you out of the business of doing DOM manipulations. So let's think about the data in your app. There are three places where you could hold that data. Every component can hold on to data in a thing that it calls state. You could have only a few top level components that hold state, and those could push data down to components inside them through what are called props. And then the last approach is to use stores, and there's an architecture called Flux that's very popular with React and kind of spreading to other frameworks, where the data is outside of the components. And when uh, a change happens, an action gets sent over to the store and it, it changes its data and then it tells the components, hey, something you were interested in changed, so why don't you re-render yourself? So a lot of options. Option number one is not really good. Uh, two and three are okay. I kind of prefer option two at this point myself uh, in a very specific case where you hold all the state of your application in a single object, one tree of data, and only the topmost component owns that, and it pushes data down to the components inside it uh, that it needs. And so if you'd like to see an example of exactly that, if you go to my GitHub repo and you look for to-do-reducer-rest, you'll see that kind of example that I think is the simplest way to use React. So as I said, this really simplifies your thought process when you're developing an app. When you're uh, thinking about your components, you ask yourself, I'm given this state and these props, often it's just props, and then you're answering the question, what do I want to render when I'm given that data? You don't think about if the data changes, what will I remove from the DOM and what will I add in its place? You just say, given this data, what do I want to render? And then a second question is, what kind of events could occur in your component? Do you have an input field where the user can type something? Is there a button that they can click? Well, if those things happen, you have basically two choices. You could dispatch an action that will end up modifying the state wherever that's being stored. Or you might choose to make an AJAX call. If you're making an AJAX call, well, nothing changes here. Uh, all the same decisions you have to make in any web app are, are present here. What HTTP method do you want to use? What URL are you sending it to? Do you want to pass some data? Is the data going on the query string? Is it in the body of a request? Do you need to update a persistent store? Uh, what's coming back in the response? And when you get that response, it could be a success or an error. In either case, you could dispatch an action which will change some state, which will cause your UI to change. So suppose my AJAX call had a failure, I might dispatch an action that sets some error message in my state. And then there's one or more components that are looking at that and then they can render that error message. And of course, if it was successful, maybe I have a collection of data that has come back. I put that on the state. When my component re-renders, if it was rendering, say, a list of things I got back from the server, then it can uh, update my UI to show that. Uh, so I do my action processing and then when the state changes, uh, depending on how I've set this up, I might need to decide which of my components care about that but in the most common scenario, I just tell the topmost component, hey, re-render yourself, and uh, everything that needs to change happens. So this diagram here, I think, is uh, interesting to illustrate this process. So I have a top-level component, 
and it may be composed of several others, and if it's the one that is managing my state, it knows the components inside it, what data they need, and so it sends them that data through props. Uh, they can re-render themselves, and then when an event happens in any of my components, if I need to make an AJAX call, I send a request over to the server, I get a response back, and then I dispatch an action, and if I'm using the Flux kind of architecture, uh, that could update some store. Now there's a specific implementation of Flux that is called Redux that is the most popular right now. And in Redux, you have just one store that holds all of your uh, application data, and it is updated through something called a reducer function. Reducer function is very simple. It gets an action object, and it gets the current state, and its job is to return a brand new state after it takes into account what happened in that action. So these reducer functions are very simple. They turn out to be pure functions that are easy to test. So as I mentioned, React is not a full stack framework. You have to pick some other libraries. And these are some very common choices. You can use React Bootstrap for your styling if you like the Bootstrap library. There are also other libraries that support things like material design and other CSS libraries. For making AJAX calls, the Fetch API and Axios are very popular choices. React Router is really the only popular router uh, in the <coughs> React community, so that's an easy choice. I talked about these reducers that are going to return the next version of the state. Well, if you've got a deep state tree, uh, you can imagine having to traverse all of that, find what you want, and modify it. And also, you're not supposed to modify the previous state. You're supposed to build a brand new state. And so using a library like Immutable that I talked about yesterday uh, is a really good choice here. And uh, so if you go to my website, you can find the slides for the talk I gave yesterday in case you didn't see that one. And the videos will be up uh, maybe in a few weeks. And then Redux is a popular choice for data management where you have a single store that is holding all of your data. Uh, yeah, that's probably all I need to say about that. So potentially, there are a lot of things that you need to learn to use React. But Pete Hunt, who worked for uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram a while ago, he's not there anymore, but he was a big name in the React community for a while. And uh, he kind of boiled it down to the order in which he recommends that you learn these different things. I don't completely agree with his order, but uh, most of it I think is good. There's a lot that you can do with just React without pulling in these other frameworks. So certainly you want to start by learning about that, and hopefully this talk gives you a head start on that. Uh, certainly you need to learn about NPM for installing any kind of uh, Java libraries. Uh, then it's common to use a JavaScript bundler, and the point here is that you want to break up your code into JavaScript modules, ES6 modules, and browsers don't support this yet, and so something has to take all these JavaScript files that import <coughs> each other, put it together into one file, and that's what a bundler does, and Webpack is the most popular of those. Uh, then you should be using ES6 features. A lot of examples I'm going to show here use these newer features of JavaScript. I already mentioned React Router, Redux, Immutable, and then there's some new thoughts on what you might do as an alternative to Ajax. I think that those are still in their early stages and probably not worth looking into just yet. So if you were going to compare React to Angular 1, I think this is a good place to start. And for those of you that are familiar with Angular 1, you know that it has its own definition of what a module is, and kind of a strange definition of a module. But the corresponding thing in React would be to just use an ES6 module. Angular has directives, React has components that you define with an ES6 class, or even as simply as just writing a JavaScript function. Uh, Angular has controllers. In React, well, that's just some code you might put in the, con in the constructor of a component or in a method in that component class. Uh, Angular has templates. In React, that's the render method that goes into your components using a thing called JSX that we'll be discussing. Uh, Angular has services. In React, you just write a JavaScript function. And Angular has filters. In React, you just write a JavaScript function. So the big takeaway here is that React feels much more like you're just writing JavaScript instead of using things that are specific to a framework. In the next several slides, I'm going to fly by this. Uh, that's the reason for the bird in the corner. It's a lot of setup information that you'd need if you want to try writing a React app, and you can get the slides later and go through all of this. But I'm using NPM, I'm creating a package.json file, I'm using Webpack, 
and Webpack Dev Server, which is a, a really powerful tool for using in development. And I've got to configure Webpack. And there's my package JSON. And when I'm done with all that, we're ready to get to work here. And so this is the simplest possible demo. And notice that I have a script tag in my HTML that pulls in the file bundle.js. And so Webpack is producing that for me. It's bundling together all of my JavaScript files and producing the one file. And a really interesting thing here when I use Webpack Dev Server is that it's doing this in memory for me. And so when I make changes to my files, it's detecting that, building a new bundle in memory and pushing it to the browser. And so it's very fast. Also notice that in the body of my HTML, I have this empty div with an ID of content. So you have to have something that you're gonna tell React to populate for you. And so down in my JavaScript code, you see that I have this call to render, and I'm giving it something that I want it to render, and I'm telling it where to render. I'm finding the DOM node that has that ID of content. Now this part looks strange to you if you haven't seen uh, React before because this is JavaScript code and right in the middle of it looks like I've slapped in some HTML. That's not exactly HTML, it's a thing called JSX and I'm gonna be talking in a bit about a few ways that JSX differs from HTML. Uh, this is a first thing that is jarring to people when they look at React. They look at that and they think, uh, why would I want to put HTML in my JavaScript? Don't I want to separate these things? I'll talk in a bit about why this is not a big deal and maybe you don't care about separating them. Uh, but one thing to notice here is that I've told it to render into a particular div, but I could have more divs here and more calls to render to render different components into different divs. But when you have an app where the whole thing is developed in React, usually you'll have a top level component that has all your other components inside it and you will have just one call to render like this. Now I could have found the body here and rendered directly into the body and you'll see some example code that does that but it's really not a good idea because there could be other things going on that insert uh, elements into the body and that will confuse React if you told it to render there but there's other things putting elements there as well so in general you want to avoid doing that. And so this npm start is uh, starting up my Webpack dev server and then I go to that URL and it's telling me hello world. And the next demo that uh, I come to, I'll, I'll actually run that for you. So JSX stands for JavaScript XML, and you put this directly in your JavaScript code as we saw, you could use it with TypeScript as well. It is very similar to HTML, but it differs in some ways that I'll explain on the next slide. So I am using a transpiler for JavaScript that understands ES6 syntax, and it also understands JSX. And so Babel is finding the JSX in my code and it converts it into calls to JavaScript function whose job is to build the DOM that I want to see in the browser. At first I thought this is going to be bad because it's gonna limit my choice of tools. I probably can only use a, a, a small set of editors or IDEs and linting tools aren't gonna understand this. But it turns out that's not the case. There are a large number of editors and IDEs and linting tools and so on that already understand JSX. So kind of the mindset of React is that template languages are really underpowered. Let's think about uh, Angular 1 where you have things like uh, ng repeat and ng if and all of those directives and, and those are great but they don't compare to the power of what you can do with the JavaScript language. And so the React approach is to say, don't give me some watered down version of what I can do to build the view. Let me just use the power of JavaScript to do that. And so we'll see that in some examples coming up. And if you have any more doubts about JSX, I'd recommend checking out this article from Corey House about JSX. So how does it differ? Well, one way that JSX differs from HTML, at least from HTML5, is that you have to terminate all the tags. So we have to go back to putting a slash at the end of our break tags and a slash at the end of an input, for example. Um, in the middle of my JSX, I sometimes want to use a JavaScript expression. And so to switch from JSX back to JavaScript mode, I put this JavaScript expression inside curly braces. Inside that, I might want to switch back to JSX mode. And so I just throw in a tag. When it sees the angle brackets, it knows I want to go back to that mode. Uh, then a couple of things that I'm not really crazy about with JSX. I can't use the class attribute on my elements to specify CSS classes. I have to use class name instead. 
And I can't use the for attribute on an HTML label. I have to say HTML4. And so I ask myself, why do I have to do this? And they say the reason is that class and for are reserved words in, key, in uh, JavaScript. And that's certainly true. I don't think it excuses this, though, because they certainly could have uh, parsed that out. They know they're in JSX mode. They see these things. Can't they translate it for me? Uh, but that's a thing that you have to remember. Fortunately, tools like Babel, when they see that, they'll say, hey, you should have used class name here if you accidentally use class. And so it's good about finding that for you. You have to camel case uh, all of the attributes. So in normal HTML, you'd say autofocus. In JSX, you have to capitalize that F. The same thing for on click. Uh, event handling attributes in JSX must be a JavaScript function. Not a call to a JavaScript function, but a reference to a function. And because of that, it means that you're going to have to get comfortable with the bind method on functions that was added in ECMAScript 5, and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, the style attribute, if you want to have inline CSS, its value is not a CSS string, it's JavaScript object where the keys are property names and the values are the values of those properties. A text area, if you want to give it an initial value, you don't put it inside the tags like you do in normal HTML. It has to be a value attribute. Uh, and you can't put XML comments in JSX. That seems really weird because it's like XML. You've got to terminate the tags. But instead, they require you to switch to JavaScript mode and then use a JavaScript comment. I really dislike that part of it. Hopefully, that will change at some point. And then uh, when you're making custom components, their names must start with a capital letter. All the HTML tags are lowercase, and that's how it distinguishes between them. If you have repeated elements in your JSX, like list items in an unordered list or TRs in a table, you have to give those things a key attribute. And that's important for the, the mechanism that React uses to decide, does it need to remove any of these elements, or do any of them possibly need to be re-rendered? So you have to give it something that's unique within the parent element. And if you forget to do that, it gives you a nice warning in the console that you've done that. And so if you're comparing uh, Angular to React and <laughs> focusing on the JSX part, you could say that Angular gives you some directives and filters, or as they're called in Angular 2, pipes, these things that you can mix into your HTML. Uh, React <coughs> instead gives you JSX that you use inside your JavaScript, and so it's more powerful because I can use any parts of the JavaScript language. And we said that there are two ways that data gets to a component. The primary way is through props. Props are just uh, appear as attributes in the JSX, and I can pass any kind of data. It could be a string, it could be an object, it could even be a function. There are two kinds of uh, components that I can write. Sometimes uh, my component is implemented as a class, other times it's just a function. If it's implemented as a class, the way I get to those props is this.props. It's an object that holds all of them. If I've written my component as just a function, then the props will be passed to that function, and I can pull them out from there. Uh, so props are used to pass read-only data in, because all I care about is what do I want to render given this data. If anything needs to change, my component will be re-rendered. I'll be given new props, and I just say, now how do I want to render this? And if I want to pass a JavaScript expression in as a prop, rather than surrounding that value with quotes like you do with a normal attribute, I surround it with curly braces. <laughs> OK, so two uh, kinds of components that I can build, all with this JSX. They can be smart components or dumb components. And uh, so maybe surprisingly, you want almost all your components to be the dumb variety. And that means that they only get data from props, essentially they only have a render method. They describe how to paint themselves on the screen. These smart components can have state and they can have life cycle methods. And I'll go over the life cycle methods a bit later. So that allows you to do some more powerful things. So I want a minimal number of smart components at the top of the hierarchy. Most of them will be dumb. And usually I want to define each component in a separate JavaScript file. And that lets me reuse them in other components any way I see fit. I just import the ones that I need. So here's an example that introduces some event handling. Uh, now let me take that back. All I'm looking at here is how to make use of props. 
So I begin by importing React itself, and then I'm going to define this component as an ES6 class. So the class greeting, it extends React component, and it has a render method. That's the most important thing here. And the render method needs to return the JSX that says what to render. So in this case, I want an H1 <coughs> element, and I say hello, and I'm expecting that I have a prop whose name is name, and I'm going to display that right there. And then at the bottom here, I'm exporting that. So that's in this file called greeting.js. And then in my main JavaScript file that I call demo.js here, I'm importing uh, uh, greeting. And then down here, I want to render it. And there you see some JSX that's using my custom component. And this is a prop. And I'm telling it to display the name Mark. And here I'm telling it where to render. So. I'm not showing the HTML file here, but it's simple like the first one, where in the body I have a div with an idea of content, and that's what I end up seeing in the browser. Now, this box right here is showing the same component implemented with just a function and not a class. So anytime your component only uses props, and it doesn't need any of these lifecycle methods that we'll talk about later, you can write it this way instead. And this is implemented with an arrow function, and so this says, I'm taking in a parameter, and what's going on with these curly braces? Well, that's a thing in ES6 that's called destructuring. What's really being passed to my function is the props object that can have any number of props on it, but I only care about one, the one whose name is name. And so this destructuring is saying extract out of the props object just that one and make that be a local variable in this function. And then this arrow function, if all I want to do is return something, and it's a single expression, I don't need the return keyword. And so it's returning that JSX. That is just beautiful. And that's one of the reasons I think that React is so simple, is that you can write components like that. There's almost no code to it. Uh, so events, I mentioned that you have to camel case the names, and then you have to set them to a reference to a function, not a call to a function. So there's basically three ways that you could handle this. Here's an example of an on-click event handler, maybe for a button. So one thing I could do is I could use an arrow function. So notice I have curly braces instead of quotes, because this is a JavaScript expression. And this is a function that takes an event object, and then I'm saying that I want to call handle click, which is a method in this class. And so that's why I have this dot and I'm passing to it the event. So that works just fine. Another way I could do it is with bind, and we'll be talking more about this in, in just a couple of slides here, but bind, you call it on a function, and it returns a new function. And in this case, I'm saying, this new function that you're creating inside you, I want the value of this to be what it is right now. That looks kind of confusing, and so it takes a while to get used to this. And as I said, I'm going to dive into that a bit more in a couple of slides. Uh, so those are two options. Another option is to do pre-binding, where I kind of do this thing with the bind, but I do it in my constructor so that it doesn't have to happen in the render. Turns out that's kind of important, because if I choose the first or second option, that means every time I render this component, it has to create a new function, and that can be a little expensive if I'm rendering many times. And so you kind of do want to do the pre-rendering. <coughs> Another point to this is that for some components, you want to implement this method called should component update, and you're kind of helping uh, React to figure out whether it should take the time to build a virtual DOM and diff it. You might say, well, my component only uses this name prop, so if name hasn't changed, don't bother with the virtual DOM stuff, just don't do it. And so if you use the first two approaches, you're kind of defeating that, okay? Um, so this is uh, registering some React-specific event handling where that event object is going to have a target property that refers to a React component instead of a DOM node. You can get to the DOM node too, uh, but it's a little specialized for React. Uh, so the second way that we can hold on to data is with state. And as we said, most of the time you don't want to put data in state. Ideally, you would only have state in the topmost component. So at some point, the data might change. Maybe you have made an Ajax call and you got some data back. And so the way to change it is you make a call to this dot set state, and you pass it an object that usually has a subset of the properties that are on your state, and it's doing a shallow kind of a merge. 
So it's just taking the properties you sent it and replacing the values of those in this big state object that it's holding on to. And then in my other methods, if I want to access something that was in state, I can do something like this, this.state.foo. I also could do it this way with destructuring. So do you see how this line right here is doing the same thing as this line? This is saying, I've got this object, and I want to use destructuring to pull out a single property from it. It's not so useful when I'm pulling out one thing, but if I was pulling out, say, three things, I could list them all in this destructuring rather than have three lines that look like that one. So you should never modify state directly. You should always modify it by calling this.setState. So let's talk about that function bind a bit. So bind, you call it on a function and it produces a new function. And there are two things that you can do in the bind. And you can do one or both. The first thing you can do is tell it what should the value of this be inside that function. And sometimes your function doesn't use this. And so you just pass null for that part. The second thing you can do is give some initial parameters to that function, fixed values. And so let's look at examples of that. So the general syntax is right here. I have some old function and I call bind and it gives me a new function. And the first thing I do is tell it the value of this and then I can give it values for initial parameters. So here's an example for the initial parameters. I have the simple function add, takes two things, it returns the sum of them. And then I can produce a new function, I'll call add five and I say, I don't care about the value of this because clearly I'm not using it up here, but I want the value for A, my first parameter, to have a fixed value of five. And so now when I call add five and I pass it 10, that's the value for B and it gives me back 15. So that's a useful thing. Give me a new function that has fixed values for some of the initial parameters. In the second example, I have this class rectangle and when I create one, I pass it a width and a height, and it holds on to those. And I have this method, getArea, that just returns the product of the width and the height. And so down here, I'm creating two rectangles. And this seems kind of wild. I take the first rectangle, and I say, give me access to your getArea method. And so it pulls it out. At this point, I just have a function. It doesn't know anything about R1. It's just the function. And then I call bind and I say, hey, I'm gonna call this new function later. And when I do, I want the value of this to be R2. And then I call that and I get 12. That's because it multiplied the three and the four because I told it the value of this should be R2. So that's an interesting kind of trick. And it turns out this is really useful in React for pre-binding uh, my methods so that I can call them from event handling. And the reason, once again, is that the event handling values must be a function, not a call to a function. Okay, uh, so yeah, pre-binding, we're gonna see that in an example coming up here. Uh, so let's look at handling an event. And here I'm gonna demonstrate something that is like two-way data binding that you often see in Angular examples. And so I have this uh, place where I can type in and notice that when I start deleting things, it's updating right away. I change that. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get here. So let's see how you would implement something like that. Uh, so first I have my call to render. Notice I'm importing this thing called greeting, and it has a prop that is set to hola, and I tell it where to render that. And so we need to see how I've implemented this greeting component. And so here it is. I'm extending from react.component, and in my constructor, I'm telling it what my initial state is. The initial state is that I'm gonna say hello to world. I also have this uh, pre-binding going on. So before I look at that, let's look down at the method itself. When I call set name, it's gonna be passed an event. And I'm going to get the target from that event and ask what its value is. And that's because it's really coming from down here, this input. And when I change what is in the input, it's gonna call set name. And then I'll get a reference to the input, get its value out, and I'm changing that part of my state. And anytime I change the state, it's gonna cause this component to re-render itself. And here's my render. So every time I render, I get this form, and inside it, I have two rows. In the first row, I display the name, and then there's the input. And then in the second row, I'm displaying the greeting, whatever that is at the time, and then the name of the person that I want to greet. Okay, so once again, what is this dot set name? It's the value that I set right here, which I got from calling bind on this method. And when I call this one, 
it will be bound to this current object. And so I have what I want. I can't call a method here, but I can call a plain function. Okay, and so that's the magic that makes that work. Uh, this part here is optional. It would be in the same file. I'm trying to do some validation, and I'm saying that this greeting component expects one property, and when you specify it, it must be a string. And if you don't specify it, it has a default. It's going to be hello. So you saw that in my example, it said hola because I specified it. But if I didn't, it would default to saying hello. Okay? Uh, so let's talk about these kind of components where you implement it as just a function. These are called stateless functional components. And uh, most of the components you write should be stateless and uh, just compose themselves from other components. And so it's like a React class that only has a render method and none of these lifecycle methods that we'll talk about later. All right, so I want to walk through a kind of a bigger app that demonstrates all of these things, and it's the classic to-do app. So in my main HTML, all I need is a place where I'm going to render this div with the idea of content, and then I'm pulling in my bundle that I got from Webpack where it has stitched together all of my JavaScript. I have some CSS that's not particularly interesting. Maybe the uh, only thing I want to focus on is this class right here, done-true, that sets the color of my text to gray and a text decoration of line through. And you see that right here on the learn react. So anytime I <coughs> click one of these, I want it to change in that way. And so let me start up uh, that one. And I forgot to kill the other server. They're both listening on the same port. Okay, there I go. I go back to the browser and refresh this. And I've got my to-do app. And I'm going to add a few things here. And I'll delete foo. I'm going to check bar. That task is finished. And I can archive all the completed ones. Notice that it says two of four remaining at the top. And so when I, when I archive the completed ones, now I have two of two remaining. Okay, and So that's everything that this app does. And so we want to walk through that functionality. OK, so I want to start with the to-do component. And the to-do component is just this part here. It's a checkbox and the text and a delete button. And I have two to-do components right here. Okay, So here is my to-do component. And it's implemented with just a function. Remember, what gets passed to this function is a props object. And I'm interested in three props. So I'm using destructuring to pull them out. I need a to-do object that tells me the text, and it tells me whether it's done. And they also have an ID. And then I need two functions. Uh, what should I do if the user clicks the checkbox? I want to toggle the done state. But this component doesn't know how to do that. All it knows is that it will be given a function, and it's going to call it when the checkbox gets clicked. What happens if the user clicks the delete button? Well, this component doesn't know. But it's given a function to call if that happens. And so all I have to do is render a list item. This is going to go inside a list. And inside my list, I want three things. The first thing I want is a checkbox. And that checkbox might already be checked. And how would I know? Well, my to-do object has this done property, which is a Boolean. If that's true, I want the checkbox to start out already being checked. If you change it by clicking the checkbox, I'll call this on toggle done. Then I have a place where I'm displaying the text of the to-do. And that's right here, to-do.text. You see how I have switched from the JSX syntax over to JavaScript syntax with these curly braces. I do the same thing for the class I want to give to this. Remember, you have to use class name instead of class. And I want the CSS class name to be done dash and then either true or false. I only had CSS for the false case, or for the true case. And that's OK. And that's what will give me the line through and change the color to gray. And then I have a button that says delete on it. And if you click that button, I'll call this on delete to do. Uh, and then some optional validation down here where I say that I'm expecting three properties to be supplied for this component. The first is a to do. That should be an object, and it is required. And then you have to give me two functions, and those are required also. And then I'm exporting the component. So the main point I want to get across here is that if you use React, You'll be writing many components like this. Very simple. Just a function. You're given some props. You say how that thing should be rendered. 
Let me move on to our to-do list, and this is uh, really the component that is the whole app. You could break this up further, but in this example, I just have these two components. So I have to-do list, my topmost component, and it's beginning by saying in its constructor, what is the initial state? Initial state has these two to-dos already in it. In a real to-do app, I guess you'd want it to start empty. But I'm starting with this first one, learn React being true, and the second one, build a React app, that's gonna default to false. And here's where I'm doing that pre-binding that I mentioned earlier. I have these three event handling methods that are in this class, but I need to be able to get to them as a function. And when I call it, the value of this should be this component that we're looking at. And so that's why I'm binding to this. Now, you can imagine that you could simplify this. You could write a utility function that would iterate through all the methods and it could say, if your name starts with on, I'm gonna do a pre-binding of you. And so you wouldn't have to hand write this every time. Okay, uh, here's my static method in this class to create a to-do. You pass in the text, and if you want, you can pass in whether it's already done, but this parameter has a default value of false. And all I'm doing is returning a simple object that has three properties in it. It has an ID whose value is the next available one. You see, I have this last ID here that starts at zero, so bump it up by one and use that. And then I have the text, and then I have done. And if you haven't seen this before in JavaScript code, this is kind of cool as well. You might have expected to see here text colon text, but in ES6, you have the, these enhanced object literals where you don't have to repeat that if it's the same thing. Okay, uh, then we get to some of the other methods in this class, and we have a getter. So this allows me to refer to uncompleted count as, it, as if it were a property, but it will call this uh, method instead. And all I'm doing here is going to my to-dos and I'm filtering down to just the ones that are not done, and then I'm finding how many there are. And that's how I get the uncompleted count. If I want to add a brand new to-do, then I know that on my state, I will have the text that the user typed in. And we're gonna see when we get to the render method how it is that that value got into my state. But I've got the state, I call create to-do, it won't be marked as done yet, because I just created it. And then I want to change my state. And there's two things I want to change. First, I want to set my to-do text to be an empty string. And if I jump ahead to the render method and I look at my uh, input right here, uh, that's the thing I'm trying to reset. Because you just entered some text, you just added your to-do. I want to clear that input now. And so it's as simple as setting that in my state to be an empty string and it will clear that. Uh, next, I need to give it the new array of to-dos. So I'm just taking the new one and I'm concatenating it to the existing one. That produces a brand new array and I've got it, okay? If I want to archive the completed ones, well, I'm really taking a shortcut here. I'm not saving them anywhere in this example. I'm just removing them. So I'm filtering out all the ones that uh, are, uh, let's see, did I do this backwards? I should be, oh, I, I want to keep the ones that are not done. And that becomes my new to-dos. Notice how what I'm passing to set state is an object with some of the properties in my state. It doesn't have to be all of them. In this case, I don't want to clear out that text input. So I'm only telling it about the new array of to-dos. Here I want to delete a specific to-do. And so I'm uh, going through all of the to-dos and I'm saying keep any of the to-dos that are not the one I'm wanting to delete. And I get a new array and I set that on my state. And uh, my next event handling is the text change. Now this one seems kind of odd. Every time the user types a character into that input, I need to make a change to the state so that I have what they have typed so far. And at first glance, you would think, boy, isn't that really expensive? Because on every keystroke, you are re-rendering the entire UI. But remember that React is not doing that. It's looking at the DOM, the virtual DOM, to see if there were any changes, and it will see that the only thing that changed was the value of the input. So it's not gonna re-render my list of to-dos, okay? And so in this case, what I pass to set state is an object that just has that one property, the to-do text. If I want to toggle the done state of one of them, I click the checkbox, then I'm past a to-do, I get its ID, and now I'm uh, iterating through them and I'm producing a new array of to-dos, and all this code ends up doing is toggling the state of the to-do 
of the one that I want to. You see how I'm checking the ID? And if I find that one, I'm going to replace it with a new to-do that has the same ID, it has the same text, but the done state gets toggled. But if it wasn't that one, I just keep that same to-do. Now this seems like a bit too much work to have to go through all of them just to toggle the state of one, and I would agree with that. And this is the point where I would introduce the use of that immutable library, because if I were using that, I could have one line of code that said, could you produce a new version of my state that has this specific change made? And I wouldn't have to write code like that. So I highly recommend using that library. Okay, so I have produced a new array of to-dos. I'm setting the state and I'm giving it this object that's that enhanced object literal again. I could have said to do's colon to do's, but that's the shorter way to do it. And then of course the most important part, the render for the top level of my app. And right here is where I'm displaying this unordered list of to do's. But before I get into this big chunk of HTML, I wanna compute all the list items that go right there. And that's what's happening here. I'm calling map on my array of to do's and one at a time I get these to-do objects and I'm creating to-do components right there. That's what will be output. I'll get an array of these to-do components. Each one has a key. That's because I'm inside a list and I have to tell it some unique way of identifying these. And so my key, in this case, can just be the ID of that to-do. Then I'm giving it the entire to-do object. I remember when we wrote that component, I said that it had three required props. And I said, this one was required and it must be an object. So I've obeyed that. Then my on delete to do and my on toggle done, those are also required and they have to be functions. Here I have to produce the function on the fly because it's just gonna call it, it won't pass anything to it. And so I'm using bind to say, produce a new function for me whose value of this will be this component and the first parameter is fixed at this. It'll be the ID of the to-do. Because if I go back and I look at how I wrote that, it's expecting an ID of a to-do. So that's what I gave it right there. Similarly for the on toggle done, the first parameter is the to-do object itself. So as you can see, it is mandatory if you're gonna become comfortable with React to get comfortable with bind. No way around that. So here is my main rendering. And you do have to render a single element, and that's why all of this is wrapped in a div. And then I've got my H2 at the top, and here's where I'm displaying the uncompleted count. Looks like I'm just accessing a property, but remember the way that I implemented that right here was as a getter. And so I can reference it just as if it were a property. Uh, then I'm getting the length of my to-dos, and there I've got it. I've got the statistics for what we're looking at right now. I can archive the completed ones. I already did a pre-binding of that method, so I can uh, set up my event handling that way. And then down to my form, I've got an input where you can type the text of a brand new to-do. And its value is whatever is in to-do text on the state. And this is not a two-way binding. I'm just saying whenever I render this, that's what should be displayed there. If you change it, it's gonna call this on text change. That will update the state, which will cause this to be re-rendered. So again, when I'm thinking about what I do in the render, I'm just saying, what do I want to render given whatever state and props I have available? Uh, then I have the button that you click to add the new one. And uh, that might be disabled if you haven't typed anything yet. And so it should be disabled if I don't have any to-do text. Otherwise, you can click it and it will call on add to-do. And then finally, I have my unordered list, and this was some of my CSS, this class unstyled, which makes it so that I don't have bullets in front of them, because I already have checkboxes at the front of each one. And then this to-dos here, well, that's what we computed up here. It was an array of to-do components that got inserted right there. Now all I have to do is say, could you please find this element in my HTML with an ID of container and render inside it a to-do list component? And then I'm done. And anytime my state changes, it'll automatically re-render and I don't have to think about any DOM manipulations. Any questions about that? All right, so I need to wrap up quick here. So let me just uh, review a few last things. The render method, very important. There are other 
component definition methods that you rarely use, but you can read about those later. There are three parts to the component lifecycle. Components get mounted, they can get updated later, and then they can be unmounted. And when these things happen, there are certain lifecycle methods that get invoked. Uh, two important ones are component did mount and component did update. And those are places where you're allowed to do some DOM manipulation. Normally you don't want to do that, but there might be cases where you need to. For example, if you need to change the focus to a certain component or you want to do some kind of animation, that's a place where you can do that. Another really important method is should component update, and that's where you can do some optimization. So while the virtual DOM and the diffing is very, very fast, you could skip even that if you add intelligent use of should component update methods. So this tells you the order in which those lifecycle methods get invoked for the uh, uh, different uh, uh, parts of the lifecycle. So what are some of the issues in using React? Well, one issue is that you need to pick an efficient way that you can modify the state of your app. Immutable suits that just fine, so I highly recommend that. Another issue is that you gotta get comfortable with bind, obviously. Uh, you have to get comfortable with JSX. It is very much like HTML, but it is not HTML. So we have that one slide of the differences. You may, maybe need to keep that slide next to you for the first couple of weeks that you're using this. You don't use HTML files. You put it right inside uh, the JavaScript code, and that's a good idea because while some people feel that separating the JavaScript and the HTML is separating concerns, the React people say it's not a different concern. It's all about the component, and so it makes sense for them to be together. Uh, there's not any built-in help for form validation in React, but there are libraries to help, and it turns out that just using JavaScript to do that isn't such a bad thing. I think the biggest benefits in using React, one is that it's very easy to create components. We saw that, how I could just write a function, and that's a component. It's very fast due to the virtual DOM and the diffing, the one-way data flow makes it easier to think about what's happen happening in the app and easier for me to test. Imagine writing a test for a component. All you'd have to do is say, here's some state, here's some props, render it, what did I get? That's a very simple thing to do. Uh, and you can use the same approach for rendering different kinds of things like canvases or uh, Android and iOS for, for mobile apps. So the big questions for you now leaving this talk is, uh, is it really easier to learn this than some other framework you might be considering? And would it maybe be a good idea for your team to pick a small app to try this on and see how you feel about it after you use it for a couple of weeks? So thank you very much for attending my talk. Feel free to find me afterwards and ask me any questions you have about React or really anything JavaScript related. Uh, so are there any questions you'd like to ask? <coughs> Okay, let me remind you to pick up a packet of information if you're interested in any of that. And uh, thanks again.